what I wanted to talk to, to you about today is just some, I suppose, approaches that we're taking for high dimensional spatial data analysis. Um, this is kind of nominally about IMC, which is the platform that we have in our call facility. Um, but uh, more broadly, I think a lot of these approaches actually apply to other kinds of spatial technologies um, as they're kind of emerging. Um, the reason I bring this up is because at some recent meetings, we're kind of looking at you know, groups using things like spatial transcriptomic data sets, the things like the Cosmex or the um, Zedium or, or the Merscope platform from VisGen. Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of discussion around things like cell segmentation, kind of spatial neighborhood calculations. And a lot of these discussions actually sound very similar to uh, conversations we had sort of back in like 2017, 2018 for IMC. And so now that, you know, a lot of these discussions are about like cell segmentation challenges and kind of like finding the border between cells, but in, in a way that feels very familiar um, for those of us who have been working with say IMC for the last few years. So I thought this would be a fun way to kind of think you know, it's pr principally about Hyperion data in this case, but it actually applies more broadly as well. So I want to talk about three things. Um, some approaches we're taking for cell segmentation that are uh, a little bit different, and I think hopefully quite flexible. Um, and then some aspects to do with how we do cellular analysis, and particularly dealing with uh, batch effects in spatial data. Okay, so cell segmentation, um, the kind of nominal process most of us will have been exposed to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Ah, thank you, Jared. Um, so most of us will be familiar with a process that looks a little bit like this. Um, we have kind of images and we w essentially want to find the boundary between cells so we can sort of isolate you know, individual single cell data. So what usually happens is we identify say a nucleus which is kind of like the anchor for each cell. Um, we identify the cytoplasm and then have the boundary between each cell kind of predicted based on one of a number of approaches. Um, and the idea here then is we can kind of segment the, the image into single cells which is very helpful. Um, there are some challenges with this approach though. Um, some of them are quite obvious, like if we have non-nucleated cells, any sort of nuclei-based approach just falls apart. So if we're looking at red blood cells, for example. Um, or if we have indeed things like fuzzy DNA, and if people are working in sort of frozen sections, you might have come across this quite a bit, particularly in mouse tissues, we get this sort of mess of nuclei which don't actually show up at all, um, which causes a bit of a problem. Um, but there's also other like non-uniform or kind of more complex cells. Um, astrocytes in the brain, for example, in blue here, are really cool cells. They do have a nucleus, but just not in this cut. So we've kind of cut through like a big chunk of cytoplasm with no nucleus. So it is a nucleated cell, but for our two dimensional purposes here, it's kind of non-nucleated. Um, cellular overlap is often a huge problem when you're getting really dense tissues. This isn't just a resolution issue, like in a you know, five to seven micron section thick bit of tissue, you do have genuine overlap of the two cells in that space. And so it's not, it's not just like, well, if the resolution was better, we'd fix this. There is actually overlap that we have to deal with in this kind of context. The worst, of course, is when all this is happening at the same time. Um, this becomes very challenging. So um, our approach uses uh, Elastic, which uh, some people will be familiar with, but essentially it works like this. Rather than trying to predict the nucleus and the cytoplasm and have the algorithm predict where it thinks the boundary between two cells are, um, we train literally on the boundaries. So, so in this case, we actually don't need to predict the nuclei at all. Um, we, we sort of take the images, um, the raw data, and we paint on layers in, in the program called Elastic. Um, we create a cell coloring, which is in yellow, boundary, which is in blue, and background, which is in red. We actually don't need a cell label in this case. We kind of just do it for like, um, so it's kind of like uh, just the muscle memory. We sort of need something where the cell is a different color to the background. But the principal thing here is we're actually just identifying the border between each cell. So we're trying to do that as accurately as possible. So once we've got that, we can sort of ask the algorithm to predict, okay, what, you know, what pixels does it think represent sort of the, the boundary between two cells and what rep represents everything else? Um, the way this then works is we can divide that image up into kind of digital boundaries between each cell and then segment the image. The nice thing about doing this is that all in the program Elastic, we can sort of see the feedback of this in real time and we can kind of refine the approach until we get a result that we're very happy with. Now this is an example just using some spleen data, which is a bit like, it doesn't look terribly different to any other segmentation approach. So if we take some uh, data from mouse brain, we've got some much better examples of why this is helpful. <coughs> so here we have a section of mouse brain, and the cells here in white are astrocytes expressing GFAP. So a complex kind of, you know, weird looking cell with no nucleus in this case. So all we're doing in blue principally is identifying the edge of that cell, and then the background or the cell body. Um, again, we don't actually need to identify the cell body in this case, but it just kind of mentally makes a bit more sense to do so. Um, and then we can ask it to predict the boundary for all the astrocytes in the image. Um, this works quite well. They can be non-uniform, they can be sort of weird shapes, they can have or, uh, or not have a nucleus. 
because um, all we're doing is essentially training it to see the edge of each of these cells, um, which kind of gets us to the outcome that we're looking for. Um, but of course, in this case, we don't have just astrocytes. We have other cells in the brain that we want to potentially deal with. Um, and so if we have you know, different kinds of cells, we actually just keep reproducing this process. So in the same layer, we can add astrocytes that are boundaries, microglia boundaries, whatever other boundaries we want, until we get kind of a comprehensive coverage of cell types. Now, this works quite well for us in our experience that we basically just keep adding more and more training until we get a pretty decent result. Um, but sometimes this can be a little bit complicated. Um, in some of our data sets, we basically have cells that are highly overlapping and trying to create a boundary basically means you're just capturing that cell as one big blob. Uh, sorry, those two cells as one big blob. So another approach, instead of having just one layer with all the boundaries, is we actually do these separately. So we can say, okay, we're gonna train um, using sort of dark blue for the astrocytes and then light blue for microglia. So two separate layers dealing with two kind of nominally different cell lineages. Um, the idea here is that they each get their own sort of prediction. Um, we can then split them apart into their kind of different uh, lineages to deal with separately and then combine that into one kind of final segmentation. Um, this just provides kind of a different way of dealing with the data set if we're struggling to get like a single layer for prediction, which, <coughs> excuse me, in our, in our experience has been very helpful, um, but it kind of is a little bit context dependent about how we apply this. So this is quite good for us. It's all based on, on the boundaries. Um, we will also add in some cool things like in Elastic in the same workflow, we can also do some object classification, which I'll, I'll circle back to in a minute. But essentially once we have each of the masks, we can then do like a first pass of trying to classify what cell belongs to what lineage before we get into any of the cellular analysis, which is kind of downstream. But I'll, I'll circle back to why that's important in just a minute. Um, and the very last thing is just some very simple like region classification. Um, again, for reasons I'll circle back to, we're, we're not huge fans of doing like neighborhood prediction in a lot of our work. A lot of the time, all we're really trying to do is classify broad regions of the tissue um, that we sort of do our classifications in. Okay, so once we have our segmentation, so each cell has kind of got a boundary to it that we can then, um, that we can work with, regardless of whether we've used our method or a different method, um, we then want to kind of pull this together to do some analysis. Um, and broadly, in this case, um, we have uh, a toolkit that we use for our, our sort of cytometry data analysis, which we call SPECTRE. Um, the long and short of it is this was a, a toolkit we would develop to do flow or site or for now single cell genomics data sets. Um, we kind of, you know, prioritize things like simple data structures, um, particularly uh, workflows that kind of made data analysis very scalable for really enor like enormous data sets that we were dealing with. And this is quite cool, but we didn't really have spatial in mind at the time. What we reasoned here was that actually it'd be cool if we could just plug in spatial data into our existing framework so that way we didn't have to kind of switch between different tools depending on you know, what particular analysis we were doing. Um, the actual reason this came up for me for the most part was in, in the Histocat program, I really just, I don't like the way the heat maps work in, Hist in Histocat. This isn't like an actual criticism, I just don't like that particular way of doing heat maps. And at the time, I was just like, this is again, not a criticism, and just personally, I was like, I don't, this is not the colors that I want, and you know, all that kind of nonsense. And I was like, it would be cool if I could just use my own stuff. Like, I'd just make the heat map the way I, I usually make it. Um, and it was like, well, actually, maybe it's not too difficult to sort of plug this stuff in. So that was essentially what we did. Um, all we're really doing for uh, our spatial data here is once we've got this, the cell segmentation masks, the region mask, any other kind of um, classification we want from Elastic, we're basically just pulling together the cellular data for each of those masks and turning it into a giant table. This is the way most algorithms will work. Like you're essentially going from spatial to single cell data and each, each kind of row of say a table, which represents a cell, has an X and a Y coordinate, maybe some boundary information and then expression levels, um, kind of like normal cytometry. Um, so to, to get spatial data to work with, say, something like Spectre is actually not terribly difficult. Um, and in theory, this would work for most other kinds of, say, site off or flow data analysis approaches, or indeed analysis approaches for single cell genomics data. <coughs> Excuse me. But essentially, this means we can do all the regular stuff that we might do with high dimensional data. We can, if we want to, we can do things like clustering or dimensionality reduction. Um, it also means, makes it amenable to gating. Um, I discovered we have a, a couple of citations for our approach for doing spatial data, but I, I realized digging through those citations that are all just people making FCS files from the, the IMC data and doing it in Flojo. I was kind of like, hey. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, you know, life gives you lemons kind of thing, um, but it works. Like it gives, it gives a, a, an approach which makes sense for people who come from cytometry, 
as opposed to people who may be coming from, say, microscopy. So this is good. We think this is kind of a helpful way of approaching things. Um, but there are some important differences in the way we deal with spatial data versus cytometry data. So this is just an example data set from mouse brain. And this is a mouse that's infected with uh, Zika virus. So it's a mosquito-borne flaviovirus. Um, and what we're going to look at here is a little section of the hippocampus. So in uh, new M here is a marker for neurons on the right. Um, so the white is just the kind of expression um, uh, of new N and the little yellow boundaries are the sort of cell masks that we created. Um, and what we can see here is that if we you know, turn this into cellular data, this kind of makes a lot of sense. Each cell is represented by a dot. Um, we kind of opted out of doing like shaped polygons that we use to represent each cell. We're kind of just going for positional data based on these little dots. Um, and through here, I think the thing that's really cool is this is, an exp this is uh, a protein which is expressed by the virus called NS1, non-structural um, protein 1, which is expressed in this specific string of neurons here. Um, this is to do with how the virus spreads throughout the brain, but it actually just ra raises a really cool point. Um, in this case, even though we've got, you know, areas of the image which are kind of next to each other, these structures are actually completely unrelated. So the virus in this case is going to spread through neurons um, throughout the structure here, but, you know, the structure along here and the structure either side of it are completely separate in terms of neuronal connectivity. So positionally, they look like they're neighboring, but they're actually completely different parts of the tissue which don't relate to each other. They do relate in a, in a way, but not enough that you get sort of, you know, prolific viral um, movement between the two different structures. So this is an important thing for us. Like two-dimensional proximity is not the complete story here. It's actually to do with the tissue structures themselves. But nonetheless, um, what we can then start to do here is to classify the cells and kind of where they are in the tissue, which is very helpful. Now, importantly, there's two different ways we're doing cell classification in the kind of cytometry-oriented way. We might be doing something like clustering or gating to sort of give each cell a label. So, you know, if it's expressing CD3, we're calling it a T cell. C11B, maybe we're calling it microglia, et cetera. Um, but this actually gets quite complicated in spatial data because there's a few little considerations we need to keep in mind. But in this case, regardless of how we've classified it, we can kind of look for what cells are showing up in what regions of the tissues and then quantify that, which is kind of the way we want to go. Now, in this case, um, so if we do the regular stuff, clustering dimensionality reduction, for example, here. So this is an example of some flow song clustering, and it's sort of uh, uh, displayed on a, a Fitzny plot, which is kind of just a, a, an adaptation of a Tisney plot. Um, and this looks kind of like what you get from side-off data. You can look at expression patterns for each of the different markers, figure out what the cell types are. And from like a bird's eye view, this looks pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we can sort of see neurons and astrocytes and microglia in different areas of the plot, which looks quite good. But if we actually look a little bit more closely, if we do clustering just on the cellular data on the left, there's this big cluster in the middle, cluster six. Um, if we look on the right, these are cell types which are annotated in elastic. So once we've done the cell segmentation, we're clicking on each cell and saying, okay, these are T cells, these are microglia, which takes into account the spatial information. So something about what that cell looks like in a two-dimensional image, which then contributes to how it's getting classified. And that big group of cells in the middle, which are represented by cluster six, you can hopefully see in here is actually a big mix of different cell types. So there's some blue and some green and some purple all mixed into there, because this is where we have, for example, T cells sitting on top of neurons, uh, or, or indeed, neurons and microglia. And so we end up with this phenotype, which is like co-expressing for three different markers. I mean, it, it, is, it is that in segmentation sense, but biologically, they're just kind of all jam-packed next to each other. So at a cellular data level, we kind of miss a lot of that nuance because we just don't really see it. Um, whereas for the spatially predicted cell types, this actually gives us a lot more insight into how these cells are, um, how these cells are associating. So yeah, this is kind of one of these like ongoing challenges that like it'd be nice if we could just cluster data and have that be the end of the story. But certainly for our work, we haven't found that to be quite enough. Um, one of the things we tend to do is like a first pass approach is the spatially classified cells mean we can kind of split cells apart into individual lineages, which we know are biologically separate, and then kind of analyze those lineages separately. Um, it's still not necessarily all, all as clean and cut as I probably make it sound, but it does, I think, help us get a little bit more insight into what's actually happening uh, in a more cellular oriented way. So that's pretty cool. We can then start to look at, you know, whereabouts in different regions of the brain do these cells show up, which gives us some insight into what's happening biologically. Okay, so um, just to kind of make the point about why I think this is important, um, when we convert IMC data, in this case segmented IMC data, into cellular data, or like single cell data, um, we can express it in ways that we'd look 
you know, we look at normally for say side off data. In this case, CD20 versus CD3 on a biaxial plot. So kind of T and B cells, which should be fairly opposed in terms of their expression. Um, but there is obviously this double positive group up the kind of the top right, which is expressing both. Now, the issue here is that if we, indeed if we cluster or if we gate this, probably more importantly, the order that we start gating the different populations will dictate what we end up calling that population. So if we gate CD3 first, they're gonna end up being called T cells. If we gate CD20 first, they're gonna end up being B cells. And so it's kind of like, well, ugh, like what direction do I take for this? Like how do I make that call? Um, and if we look at the spatially annotated data sets, it actually gives us a bit of a clue as to how these cell subsets are differentiating from each other. So I mean, you can sort of see like down the bottom, a bunch of the T cells are kind of out this way. A bunch of the B cells are right up the top there, um, but it's actually quite complicated. And in this particular example, which is, um, it's actually not from brain data, it's from a spleen data set. But there's even weirder things like this group up here, which is like myeloid cells, which seem to be co-expressing CD3 and CD20. And it's like, well, that, that's rubbish, you know, that's surely that's not. Well, in this case, I mean, in this case, they're just sitting on top of like a dense area. Or in this case, they are. Um, I Actually, I should have shown the spatial image for this to make the point. Um, this is a, I guess, an imaging uh, effect. So in this case, they're not genuinely co-expressing co it. This is literally the myeloid cells sitting on top of those two cells, which, I mean, for us makes sense and that association is quite important, um, but it does kind of, for us at least, highlight why taking, into, taking the spatial information into account actually helps us get better cellular resolution as well. Um, so yeah, it's not, not all doom and gloom, uh, like it's, it's a tricky area and I think there's a lot of compromise in the way we do this analysis. Um, so I don't think it's like a solved issue, but there are some ways that we can pull together the cellular information with the spatial information. Yes, I worry about that constantly. <laughs> Myeloid cells are little jerks. Uh, those, those data from the, uh, the yes, yeah, yeah. This, this one, I really, in hindsight, I really should have put the actual image up. This was not a like a like a, an FC mediated non-specific thing. This is just the two D overlap. One question. Oh. One thing yeah. to point out really quickly, this mm. is an IMC image, correct? Yes. So this is probably a five micron section that the whole section got burned. Exactly, yes. On an optical image, your Z resolution, your uh, axial resolution is only like two microns. Mm. And so when we're looking at these things optically, we're still thinking of a thinner plane than what we yeah. actually look at here. So we see more variance mm. in the Z depth that we don't really think about because we call them planes instead of... Yeah. Five microns. I mean, that's that exact thought had taken us down the road of like trying to get thinner and thinner sections for IMC, but at some point it was just not practical to keep doing that all the time. Oh gosh, it was just a nightmare. It was like, you know what, we'll just deal with it in sort of post-processing. But yes, these are the things where it was like, oh, actually, we're actually making the problem worse because indeed we're not just using a plane, it's the whole thickness of the tissue. And it's like, well, okay, we have to rethink this a bit. Um, but anyway, so I don't have a solution. I just have some approaches that I think make the challenge a little bit easier. Um, if anyone does have like out and out solutions, then I'd be interested to hear. Um, okay, so with all of that together, oh, and just, yeah, so the one of the final points here is that uh, for us in our context, one of the reasons we lean on this kind of regional analysis where we're just looking at like sections, so sections probably a, a unhelpful term to use, areas of the ROI, my goodness, I need to work out the terminology for this better. Structures in the brain, you know, even though in 2D they're right next to each other, they're completely unrelated. And so in this case, we basically can just classify different regions of tissue. So that way when we analyze them, they're analyzed independently. Um, this just avoids problems like, you know, having these two cells be sort of lumped together into a neighborhood because in reality, those two cells have got nothing to do with each other in the three-dimensional brain structures. Um, so it's kind of just a simple trick. It's like analyzing different areas of the image separately. Um, but that's essentially, that was enough to get us kind of some slightly more impactful information from our brain analysis. So that's very helpful. <coughs> um, uh, in our toolkit, just to kind of make the, make the point, we do very simple metrics. Um, so we don't do any, really anything fancy. We don't do any like imputation or neighborhood prediction stuff. We're kind of just asking like how many cells are there in different areas and how close they are to the cells around them. Um, it's really just like low ball stuff. That was kind of what we needed. Um, so if you're looking for low ball calculations of spatial data, we have some options here. Um, if you want something fancier, there are other tools, but it kind of you know um, leads me to my next point, which is actually that like 
Interoperabil interoperability between tools is very important. So like we don't have um, we don't have like neighborhood prediction analysis, for example, in Spectre, but the idea is that there are many other tools that do this kind of calculation. And if you have the ability to, for, um, for example, to kind of take know, an output from our approach and then run it through IMC tools or any of the other approaches, you can then start to kind of gain the best of you know, both worlds, so to speak. Um, so this is very important. There are some efforts recently to create, <coughs> excuse me, standardized data structures for new kinds of spatial data that are coming out. Um, this is still, I think, a work in progress, but the capacity to kind of convert from one format to another means that you can sort of start in one area of spatial biology and move it into another if that's the thing that's going to help you with your analysis. Um, we do quite a lot of this now. Um, this this uh, preprint here is for is a data structure for like spatial transcriptomics type data sets, which is actually quite amenable to things like um, IMC data as well. So yeah, this is definitely an ongoing and kind of developing area, but I think there's some you know really exciting potential here. Okay. So the very last point I want to make um, is dealing with batch effects in, in, in imaging mass cytometry data. Um, and just to kind of you know, set the scene a little bit, if we're dealing with CITOF data, for example, um, and you're running look, two different samples on different days, you've stained them separately and run them separately, we end up with like, technical differences between the samples. Um, and if you try to do something like you know, clustering or UMAP, you end up with an effect like this, where your two different samples look different, right? Because in this case, they might be an identical sample type, but there's technical differences that make them sort of, you know, separate from each other. And so, okay, like you could have a sort of minimal batch effect where like a population is splitting apart a little bit, or it can be a lot more intensive. Um, so in this case, there are tools like Cytonorm, which I won't sort of labor the point terribly heavily, but this approach is really cool. Um, I really like it, and it's very popular in sort of CITOF and flow data. You're essentially taking reference samples. So if, you're, if you've got a whole bunch of batches that you're trying to run, you might have a single donor who's given a bunch of blood, and then with each batch you take one of those vials. You know, each of those vials, by definition, are biologically identical, and so you're modeling the technical differences basically across each batch, and you can use that to reduce the batch effects. So that's very cool, but it is limited. You kind of need to have like coverage of the different expression levels that might show up in the samples. That's not always possible if you've got, say, like highly activated or kind of differentiating cells. So it has limitations, even though I find it very powerful. Um, but the world of kind of single cell genomics has a quite a few options in this space, which is, you know, the reason that these have emerged are for very different reasons. But as it turns out, they're all actually, they, they work on cytometry data reasonably well. Um, so for example, if we take some IMC data, um, sorry, some, some CITOF or some flow data, um, we kind of just, you know, to test how this works, it's like, well, can, actually, can we use some of these tools to integrate, say, across technologies? Um, and the answer for the most part is yes. Like, you actually can get different types of technologies to integrate with each other. Um, so in this case, these are three different cytometry technologies, but this also works for things like SiteSeq, for example, which is um, derived through a single cell gen genomics technology. You can actually get data to kind of, you know, integrate successfully across technologies, which is pretty cool. So in our case, we were like, well, can we get this to work on IMC data? So this is a liver data set we worked on a while ago, and each cell is kind of colored by the batch that it came from. And you can see like, okay, this isn't helpful. All the batches are separating based on the date that we ran the sample. Um, using one of a number of, number of approaches, we can actually get the data to kind of reintegrate. And so you, now when you're doing clustering or other kinds of analysis, you're measuring sort of like for like. Um, this is not like a solved thing. I don't, I don't think like, yeah, here we go. We've kind of nailed the problem. I think we've made some progress with this, and this is kind of helpful, but I think it's also like some major challenges here we ne haven't necessarily solved. There's the issue of technical day-to-day -day variation, but in the case of imaging, there's also your ROI difference. Mm. <laughs> what are, you, in this corrected versus per batch versus RPCA, which or both of those are you cleaning yeah, yeah, up Yeah, 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 yeah. So in this case, I'm, what I'm really targeting is the, I'm gonna just gonna say the sample prep. So like the ROIs from one big run are essentially all one batch effectively. Um, so th I mean, that's a really good point. In, the, in this case, I'm really targeting like, so this thing was actually higher background levels of a couple of my antibodies because I, it was a new vial, we had to use a bit more and just the background staining went up. And so all the cells now have I don't know, higher background CD20 or whatever. And it's just like, well, I mean, damn, it was really irritating. And so this can kind of just dial that back down a little bit. 
Um, there's a much bigger story behind this and the caveats, which I, I don't, I didn't intend to go into detail about, um, which is why I prefaced, prefaced it by like, I don't think this means we've solved it. I just think it means we've got some inroads into it, like starting to approach this. So it comes if you embed catalyst correction in with this batch correction, does it help get it that background initially? So you first push the catalyst correction through, mm. which will, sorry. Okay. So if you embed the catalyst correction, so if you take your, whether it's by site or you take the beads and you make your slide, mm -hmm. Then you can embed, you can measure the spill, and then adjust some of the background levels first. And I wonder if then your batch correction would be improved. Potentially, we our, our issue has not really been much to do with spillover for the most part. It's mainly been a staining issue, and I I don't know if this is correct across the field. Most of my experience with dealing with batch problems have been sample prep related, as opposed to instrument related. Um, and that may not necessarily like ring true for everybody. That's certainly been my experience. So, but I mean, you're absolutely right. Like that would that would contribute to dialing this down, right? Like well, if, and, if that takes away some of the initial kind of differences, then that's going to help. The, and the other advantage of the catalyst is it gives you a ground truth that's independent of the biology. Right. Right. So if you measure the same catalyst bead set mm. on different days, then it should tell you about the fluctuations in the performance of the system. Indeed. Yeah. Right. Especially, I mean, and that kind of thing, there's also a big application there in like multi-site work where that potentially would make a huge difference. So two things, mm. when you say sample prep, are you talking about when the tissue was embedded because that's part of the yeah. sample prep and that's a very challenging thing in places like where I work? Yeah. Are you trying to calculate that at all or you're just like, we're gonna assume so I, they're all equal? So I guess in this case, yeah, there's, there's a bit of a decision point there. Um, so it depends a little bit on the context. Um, so. Yeah. For this work in particular, it was mostly about the staining, less of the actual like embedding. So on balance, I would say that's more of where my focus is, but certainly in FFP, perhaps like it's hugely variable in terms of the quality of that on like one sample, it would be great. And the next one would be terrible. And that's absolutely part of it. Mm -hmm. um, my experience so far has been mostly on preps, which have been all pretty comparable. And it's like the staining that's the real issue. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that is part of it. This should not solve, this should give inroads into both of those issues because it's going to find the way that most of these work is kind of, I, I call it like convergence. It'll find cells that match cross data sets, which is a helpful way to approach it. Cause it, even if it's the staining and, or if it's the actual embedding, it'll still find what matches most closely across the data sets. So yeah, there's Are a, you playing with any cell pellet arrays yet? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> it is on the list. I, I think I, I can. I would like to give some comments. Please. I think this what you just uh, uh, what we just discussed discussed about is a common issue about this kind of a batch um, correction. And there is actually another type of batch correction is they actually include a reference sample even for mm. the IMC. Yeah. So those things with those uh, um, reference sample, then you can actually solve a lot of your questions. I Absolutely. Mean, that's, yeah. yeah, and certainly there's one of the large IMC groups in our in our institute has been doing that um, pretty consistently. Even so, even if we take these approaches, like having a reference control of some kind, like even if we're not using it to drive the integration, it at least allows us to assess the integration. Because the thing we always worry about is like, you know, did I just delete a population by running? So like RPCA is a tool from Surat, for example. So it's it's kind of like the de default canonical correlation analysis, but it's a bit more scalable. But yeah, like maybe it just decides to remove a population because it was like, I can't, you know, this matches most closely with this and it's completely irrelevant. So there's, you know, they're powerful, but they're also risky. And I think including something like a reference control means you can be like, hey, it looks like it's done a good job or like, no, it's actually completely screwed it up. So I agree, even if it's not actively driving the, the approach, I think it's a critical to be able to evaluate it correctly. Great. Um... Yeah, let's let's uh, I love the interaction. Let's hold any more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just wrap up here. Sorry, I was just just by habit. <laughs> so, in conclusion, um, yeah. So this has just been our take on the spatial data. It's it's like not designed to kind of stand on its own. It's designed to kind of tackle problems that we were facing and interoperate with other um, approaches. It, most of this stuff is online. In case you want to give it a shot or read some more, so feel free to visit the website if you want to have a look. Um, but otherwise. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, there's a couple of people to thank. Um, this is actually the wrong acknowledgement slide, but I, it's from the talk I'm giving later in the conference, but 
most of these people have been involved in like the larger project of developing this approach, um, these spatial approaches. Um, but Felix and Giovanna um, in the red there have been the kind of key co-developers for this work. So they're the main, be main people to shout out to. Thanks very much. Um, we'll wrap up there. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, that was great. Um, so I heard we have um, our next speaker connected. No? <laughs> OK. She should be connected in just a sec. Maybe we can take another question while we wait. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I have a question about a se cell segmentation. Um, I, I just want to uh, know more about this standard. Like, uh, if we, we keep optimizing the algorithm and the, to get a, what kind of standard. Um, I'm always imaging something like um, we want it to be, we want segmentation to be accurate, but for accurate for what? To probably evaluate the cell frequency yeah. like uh, as much. But if we try that on the actual section, we can we don't even know what the actual like uh, frequency of those immune cells. So it, it, do, do you think that it is possible to try to optimize the segmentation algorithm with a how to say s section of uh, cell palette like uh, something you know, twenty percent T cells, forty percent B cells, and then you just do the cut, do the section on the cell palette, and then you know pass to your algorithm. Yeah, that's a that's a. Really interesting question. So my, my experience of that in say like brain tissue, for example, where like the composition and the, the morphology is really complex is like, it's just not comparable to do like a cell pellet. Um, I do like that idea, but I think what I'm, tragically the standard I'm comparing and pairing it against is like my pathological experience, path, my experience in pathology. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, take, take it however it is that it sounds to you. Um, but it's, it's kind of like looking at it, my assessment in terms of like what's happening immunologically is what I'm benchmarking the algorithm against, whether that's right or wrong. So I'm not necessarily saying that's what we should be doing, but that is what I am doing. Um, and I, I suspect a lot of us are doing, even if we don't want to admit it as directly as that. So like I look at it and I go, yeah, that's, that's matching what I can see in the image um, based on experience in pathology. And that, that I don't know, that's, that's the thing that gets me over the line. Yeah, for, thank you. That may be more accurate, I think. <laughs> Maybe. Jump in to say that like your your eyes can deceive you when you're just looking at a spatial at a, at a segmentation. So um, sometimes like blinded sort of uh, annotations of a small region and then comparing what the segmentation looks like can actually be quite helpful. So. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks.